Hello class and welcome. Here we are um, studying turn of the century literature continued. Last week we studied turn of the century literature and so we're still studying more. Welcome to this week. Um, it's a fun time period. It's when the 1800s turn into the 1900s, that kind of transition between the 19th century to the 20th century. And this week we're focusing on just one writer, in particular Kate Chopin, and the novel of hers that we read for class this week is The Awakening. It's probably her most famous work. Um, of course, she's also famous for her short stories. So let's delve into Kate Chopin. Uh, if you look at the written out lecture, um, I have included several links. If you want more information about Kate Chopin or her works, um, feel free to explore some of those links. There's a website with more biographical and literary information. There is a transcript of the Louisiana Public Broadcasting documentary uh, called Kate Chopin, A Reawakening. And it premiered on PBS in, um, on June 23, 1999. There's a YouTube video analyzing the awakening. So that's kind of interesting if you would like a little more information about meaning in the awakening. Um, the subject heading, of course, that the video is included under is called literary realism. And of course, we're studying literary realism during the turn of the century, and especially in conjunction with Kate Chopin, because she uses both realism and regionalism. Regional, regionalism, as you recall, is the use of like uh, local, regional customs, uh, language, dialect, accent, uh, clothing, social mores, anything that 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 is that is very localized to a particular area, very very indicative or descriptive of of a particular area. So, um, you notice in the work um, of Chopin's that we're reading, The Awakening, there's a lot there are a lot of local expressions, especially thrown in there, like a lot of French expressions um, and Creole and Cajun, and a lot about that culture, right? That that um, lived in that area of Louisiana in the turn of the century. There are a lot of, um, yeah, geographical features put in. You know, we have Grand Isle. That's the island in which um, the Pontelliers vacation. And then New Orleans, a lot of information about New Orleans, which is where, of course, the Pontelliers live when they're not on vacation. So, um, and it talks about biz local businesses from the time period, uh, a lot of good historical information. And that's the mark of regionalist literature when it very much incorporates the times and the place um, where and when uh, the work is situated. So there you go. Um, and literary realism, of course, is that slice of life that we get um, about a particular time period and place and, and character's life, you know, where it feels very much like we are maybe not in a grandiose plot, but in a very maybe mundane one. In other words, it, it deals with the daily going, the daily goings on of a character's life. Um, so, you know, not to say that this is a boring plot by no means. It's extremely compelling in the way it's written. Um, the language that it uses is so beautiful, so evocative of um, the sea and, and the ocean and um, the climate and the clime of that time period and place. Um, and we really feel as if we have quite a window into Edna Pontellier's life. We see her day-to-day -day activities. And that is very much the mark of literary realism. Uh, and the plot is very compelling, but it is a very, you know, basic plot of somebody's life, how they live their lives and how it begins or how it ends, um, you know, and what we go through on a day-to-day -day basis in that character's life. So welcome here to literary realism and literary regionalism in the form of uh, Kate Chopin's novel, 
the awakening. All right, Kate Chopin. Oh, one more thing. YouTube clip features actual locations from Chopin's awakening, and that's in the written out lecture. And there is a 60 second recap playlist of videos that analyze various components from characterization to symbol to theme, etc. in the awakening in the awakening. So feel free to look at those if you would like to learn more about the novel and those items within it. And uh, there's an IMDb page that lists films made from Kate Chopin's works. And finally, um, there is a, a school tube video of um, a movie made from The Awakening, which is called The Grand Isle. It dramatizes the story of The Awakening. And if you're a Heroes fan, it stars Adrian Pastar as Robert Lebrun, you know, who of course is highly uh, significant to and in Pontellier's life, so that's a little fun. Um, and I've never seen the film actually, so I can't comment on its quality or accuracy. My guess is, you know, as all film versions of novels are, they're not entirely accurate. They may take liberties with text and with the plot, but might be fun to check out. But again, I can't comment on it because I haven't read it. My guess is since it's a schooltube.com video, its clarity probably isn't the greatest quality, but yeah, it's worthwhile to check out, I suppose, if you'd like to see more. Um, all right, Kate Chopin is an American. She lived from 1850 until 1904, so she lived till about 54 years of age. Ah, that's just not too much older than I am. Wow. We're about the same age that I am, actually, so not, I mean, to me, I wouldn't consider that a long life. For the times, it may be longish, but not entirely long, because you do have people living you know, longer than that. Clearly, Mark Twain lived into his 80s. Um, anyway, her life was cut short. Um, she was born to um, an Irishman, Thomas O'Flaherty, and Eliza Ferris of French-Canadian descent. Kate spoke both French and English at home. Um, the influences of the French language, culture, and literature, of course, recur throughout her writings. Um, and in particular, the writing of hers that we read this week, you'll definitely see that um, in The Awakening. For instance, Chopin's most famous piece, of course, The Awakening, that we're reading that was published in 1899, is filled almost entirely with people of French Creole and French Cajun descent, except for notably the protagonist, Edna Pontellier, who herself is from Presbyterian, Kentucky. So while they're Catholic, Cajun, and Creole, and of French descent, Edna is not of French descent. She is from Kentucky, and she's Presbyterian. She's not Catholic. So she very much stands as an outsider to the society. And you'll see that as forming, you know, quite a theme within the novel, that she is an outsider. She stands on the outside of their culture and of their norms and mores and religion and culture. Uh, so that sets her apart and maybe kind of alienates her to a degree and makes her maybe crave for, um, well, she definitely has individuality and she's carving out more of that throughout the novel. Um, perhaps she uh, craves some, I don't know, fitting in that maybe drives her to um, companion herself so much with Robert Lebrun, especially in the beginning. Um, but you know, it's an interesting dynamic that goes on with her, both the, the, um, pull on one hand to, um, carve out her individuality. Um, but then that standing out aspect that maybe throws her to maybe try to understand the culture more and maybe companionship her with, um, particular people like Mademoiselle Rice, uh, Adele Retignol and Robert Lebrun, and even Elsay et Robin. Of course, her husband, uh, Léonce Pontellier, is very much part of that culture. He's French Creole and Catholic, and a native of New Orleans, uh, of uh, Louisiana. Like Edna, Kate hailed from outside Louisiana, which later inhabited Kate's entire married life, although Kate herself was a Catholic, um, whereas, of course, Edna was not. And then was from Kentucky and was Presbyterian, while Kate was Catholic, but also from outside of Louisiana, from Missouri. Uh, Kate grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, where Kate's father was a successful businessman who unfortunately died in a tragic railway accident when Kate was only five years old. 
Kate was thereafter reared by her mother and her French great-grandmother. Perhaps this maternalistic upbringing helped form Kate's strong individualist female characters, all of whom Kate treats as real people with needs and lives of their own, extrinsic of their status as mothers and daughters and wives. Quite the turn of the century, new women, all of these characters, and perhaps Kate herself and the women who raised her. Of course, Edna Pontellier is clearly one such character, at least by the end of the great awake of her great awakening. From age five to eighteen, Kate attended the St. Louis Academy of the Sacred Heart, except for one year when she studied at the Academy of the Visitation, both Catholic institutions. Sources say while at school she garnered the award for master storyteller an understandable recognition for the woman who would later capture life so evocatively in her many stories of local Louisiana color. At 18, she made her debut in St. Louis society as one of its most desirable belles. At 19, Kate married Oscar Chopin, whose father was a French Creole. During the Civil War, Oscar himself lived in Europe. Kate on the other hand, spent the war in St. Louis, a state that had divisive views on slavery, where some wanted slavery and others didn't. Kate's family did have slaves, however, um, and her half-brother died of typhoid fever while he fought in the Civil War for the South. Uh, Oscar's family earned its affluence from cotton trading. When Oscar and Kate married, they took a honeymoon tour of the Northeast and Europe. It reminds me of that European tour that um, Léonce Pontellier um, talks about wanting to have with his wife and his kids, if you recall, in, during, the, during the book. He's, he's uh, kind of holding that out to Edna as kind of like a carrot going because he notices that she's acting strangely and um, seems not to want to spend time with the kids and perhaps that's his way of um, trying to uh, retrieve her from whatever peculiarity that has encompassed her if you know if you remember in the novel he talks to dr mandalay about her peculiar behavior all right um oscar and kate settled in New Orleans, Louisiana, the setting actually for much of the awakening, because that's where the Ponteliers lived too. While Kate lived in New Orleans, she also spent many a summer vacation on Grand Isle, as, uh, which is the other mother, ma major location in the awakening. And of course, Edna, we, the first part of the novel is Edna vacationing with her family on Grand Isle as well. Oscar's family earned its um, oh, wait, sorry. Kate bore all six of her children between the ages of 21 and 28. When she was 29, however, because of financial problems, very much unlike Edna, because Edna, you know, has everything, every material item she could want in her home in New Orleans. Um, but Kate and her husband and their six children had to move to a cotton plantation in Natchitoches, Louisiana. Yeah. It looks like Natchitoches, but it's actually pronounced Nakatuck. Um, Only three years later, however, Kate's husband died of swamp fever, which pe most people think was probably malaria, which, of course, was endemic in those areas that were very swampy. Uh, you know, and so I had a lot of mosquitoes, and mosquitoes, of course, carry malaria. Kate was devastated when he died. There she was, a 29-year-old with six children, living on a plantation in swampy Nacatuck, Louisiana, not an area that she's familiar with. Bravely, however, Kate tried to make a go of the, of the Louisiana plantation with the six children by herself. She even had an affair with a local married man, reputedly. However, after two years, she moved back to St. Louis, where, at the urging of her mother, Kate and her children could enjoy better schools and a stable life away from the swamp and from the vicissitudes of a plantation. Of course, it's easier if she's not trying to work that plantation by herself with her six children, and she has help for those six kids when she moves back to St. Louis and has her mother there to help her. Um, 
<laughs> However, not long after Cave moved back home, her mother died. Kind of like she moved back to she moved to Nacogdoch, and then her husband died. Uh, unlike the doctor of Charlotte Perkins Gilman, you know, S. Weir Mitchell, that doctor, unlike that doctor, Kate's doctor and longtime family friend, Frederick Kolbenheyer, urged Kate to turn to reading and writing as ways to assuage the 